my lovely, lovely imps, Henry Kissinger is dead. Dead at 100 years old. And we have an article to read about him because thankfully uh, uh, some people are saying the truth about him. Uh, it's really interesting, by the way. I've gone and looked uh, now that this news has hit. I've gone and just very quickly scanned a couple of the obituaries. And even the uh, articles that should supposedly be writing glorious, praising articles about Henry Kissinger, um, they can't seem to get it up for him. It just seems uh, it just seems they can't quite get the excitement up for him. They are just like, he had a lot of power. He Boy, he sure had a lot of power. But I figured, let's read this Rolling Stone obituary for Henry Kissinger. So without any further ado, let's enjoy this together. Henry Kissinger, war criminal beloved by America's ruling class, finally dies. The infamy of Nixon's foreign policy architect sits eternally beside that of history's worst mass murderers. A deeper shame attaches to the country that celebrates him. Henry Kissinger died on Wednesday at his home in Connecticut, his consulting firm said in a statement. The notorious war criminal was 100. Measuring purely by confirmed kills, the worst mass murderer ever executed by the United States was the white supremacist terrorist Timothy McVeigh. On April 19, 1995, McVeigh detonated a massive bomb at the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City, killing 168 people, including 19 children. The government killed McVeigh by lethal injection in June of 2001. Whatever hesitation a state execution provokes, even over a man such as McVeigh, necessary questions about the legitimacy of killing even an unrepentant soldier of white supremacy. His death provided a measure of closure to the mother of one of his victims. It's a period at the end of a sentence, said Kathleen Treanor, whose four-year-old McVeigh killed. McVeigh, who in his own psychotic way thought he was saving America, never remotely killed on the scale of Kissinger the most revered American grand strategist of the second half of the 20th century. The Yale University historian Greg Grandin, author of the biography Kissinger's Shadow, estimates that Kissinger's actions from 1969 through 1976, a period of eight brief years when Kissinger made Richard Nixon and then Gerald Ford's foreign policy as national security ad advisor and secretary of state. That's right, he served both positions an unbelievable amount of concentrated power. This is one of those situations where this is the type of guy where the historical record will never shield his name because the amount of power he controlled was unprecedented. He sat in both of those positions. Meant the end of between three and four million people. That includes crimes of commission, he explained, as in Cambodia and Chile, and omission, like greenlighting green lighting Indonesia's bloodshed in East Timor, Pakistan's bloodshed in Bangladesh, and the inauguration of an American tradition of using and then abandoning the Kurds. The Cubans say there is no evil that lasts a hundred years, and Kissinger is making a run to prove them wrong, Grandin told Rolling Stone not long before Kissinger died. There is no doubt he'll be hailed as a geopolitical grand strategist, even though he bungled most crises leading to further escalation. He'll get credit for opening China, but that was de Gaulle's original idea and initiative. He'll be praised for the detente, and that was a success, but he undermined his own legacy by aligning with neocons. And of course, he'll get off scot-free from Watergate, even though his obsession with, da with Daniel Ellsberg really was, the was what drove the crime. No infamy will find Kissinger on a day like today. Instead, in a demonstration of why he was able to kill so many people and get away with it, the day of his passage will be a solemn one in Congress, and shamefully, since Kissinger had reporters like CBS's Marvin Kalb and the New York Times' Hendrick Smith wiretapped. Kissinger, a refugee from the Nazis who became a pedigreed member of the Eastern establishment that Nixon hated, was a practitioner of American greatness, and so the press lionized him as a cold-blooded genius who restored America's prestige from the agony of Vietnam. Not once in the half-century that followed Kissinger's departure from power did the millions the United States killed matter for his reputation, except to confirm the, a ruthlessness that pundits occasionally find thrilling. America, like every empire, champions its state murder murderers. The only time I was ever in the same room as he Henry Kissinger was at a 2015 national, national security conference at West Point. 
He was surrounded by fawning army officers and ex-officials basking in the presence of a statesman. Seymour Hirsch, the investigative reporter who was the most prominent exception to the fawning coverage of, of Kissinger, watched journalistic deference take shape as soon as Kissinger entered the White House in 1969. His social comings and goings could make or break a Washington party, Hirsch wrote in his biography, The Price of Power. Reporters like the Times' James Reston were eager participants in what Hirsch called an implicit shakedown scheme. That is, access journalism, in which reporters who got inside information in turn protected Kissinger by not divulging either the full consequences of his acts or his own connection to them. Kissinger's approach to the press was his approach to Nixon, sniveling obsequiousness. Although Kissinger could vent frustration on reporters that he, could never, that he never could on his boss, Hirsch quotes H.R. Hadelman, Nixon's chief of staff, remarking that Kissinger was the hawk of hawks inside the, war, inside the White House, but touching glasses at a party with his liberal friends, the belligerent Kissinger would suddenly become a dove. That's what I was saying just before we began this segment, um, that Kissinger was the ultimate of war hawks. And if you remember a war, Kissinger probably had a finger in it. Um, <laughs> Iraq, uh, Cambodia, uh, uh, which led into Vietnam, uh, the first Iraq and second Iraq wars, Afghanistan, he's got his hands in it. Reviewing one of Kissinger's litany of books, Hillary Clinton in, tw in 2014 said Kissinger was a friend whose counsel she relied upon as Secretary of State. Possessed, uh, he possessed a conviction that we and President Obama share, a belief in the indispensability of continued American leadership in service of a just and liberal order. Kissinger told USA Today within days that Clinton, presumed then to be a president in waiting, ran the State Department in the most effective way that I've ever seen. The same story noticed a photograph autographed by Obama thanking Kissinger for his consent, continued leadership. It's always valuable to hear the reverent tones with which American elites speak of their monsters. When, Kissing, when the Kissingers of the world pass, their humanity, their purpose, their sacrifices are foremost in the minds of the respectable. American elites recoiled in disgust when Iranians in great numbers took to the street to honor one of their monsters, Qasem Soleimani, after a U.S. drone strike executed the Iranian external security chief in January of 2020. Soleimani, whom the United States declared to be a terrorist and killed as such, killed far more people than Timothy McVeigh. But even if we attribute to him all the deaths in the Syrian civil war, never in Soleimani Soleimani's wildest dreams could he kill as many people as Henry Kissinger. Nor did Soleimani get to date Jill St. John, who played Bond girl Tiffany Case in Diamonds Are Forever. K Kissinger's ascent occurred through an obscenity that time cannot diminish. What a line. What an absolutely, absolutely banger line there. Holy moly. I just want to take a minute to, to, to catch our breath. This is a pretty intense um, article so far. Um, but uh, I'm happy to be a part of the uh, part of the world that is not celebrating or remembering fondly the death of a guy who killed so many people. I don't think that is something worthy of reverence. I don't think that type of national pride or patriotism or liberalism, which I think is uh, both a, a giant self-report for liberalism and also a, 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 a disgusting representation of the current state of liberalism in the world. I don't think those types of people should be celebrated. I think they should be reviled. I think they should be uh, distrusted and uh, and not allowed to get power. I dream of a world where people like Henry Kissinger can never do what they did, that they never get to that point in the first place. But unfortunately, we don't yet live in that world. By the way, if you're enjoying this reading of a properly, fairly critical uh, critique of Henry Kissinger on the day of Henry Kissinger's death, make sure that you press subscribe and like down below. And if you think I'm if you think I'm being disgusting by being uh, relieved that a monster is gone from the world, well, why don't you tell me about it in the comments? I would love to uh, ignore what you have to say. Let's continue. 
1969, Lyndon Johnson agreed to peace negotiations with the North Vietnamese in tacit recognition of the nightmare he, building on the works of his two immediate predecessors, brought to life in Vietnam. Remember what I said? Kissinger, an influential Cold War defense intellectual at Harvard, had access to members of the diplomatic delegation to the Paris talks. He used it to feed information from the negotiations to Richard Nixon, Nixon's presidential campaign, a campaign who would go on to defeat the GOP rival David Rockefeller, Kissinger, Kissinger advised, and despite Kissinger's close political ties to the coterie around Hubert Humphrey, uh, Nixon's Democratic rival. Nixon ran for president, claiming to have a secret plan to end the war, war. His advisors told Hirsch they were deeply afraid that Johnson and Hanoi would reach an accord before the election. It would save lives in Vietnam, American and Vietnamese, but it would undermine Nixon's hope of exploiting the explosion in domestic anti-war sentiment. Nixon gratefully took what Kissinger gave him to make the U.S.'s proxy regime in Saigon, whose regime uh, peace would destabilize, more intransigent. No agreement was reached until 1973, and the war ended in American humiliation with Hanoi's 1975 victory. Literally extending a bloody conflict simply because uh, you as a foreign power want to, uh, you as somebody who is aspiring to the leadership positions of a foreign power want a better chance at that. The, the, the deranged selfishness of actively working to extend a bloody and brutal conflict. Mind you, that was killing Americans for personal gain. Deranged. It took some balls to give us those tips, Richard Allen, a foreign policy researcher on the Nixon campaign, later reflected to Hirsch. After all, it was a pretty dangerous thing for Kissinger to be screwing around with, with, uh, with the national security. Every single person who died in Vietnam between the autumn of 1968 and the fall of Saigon, and all who died in Laos, Cambodia, and Cambodia, where Nixon and Kissinger secretly expanded the war within months of taking office, as well as all who died in the aftermath, like the Cambodian genocide, their destabilization was set into motion, died because of Henry Kissinger. We will never know what might have been. The question of Kissinger's apologists and those in the U.S. foreign policy elite who have stood in or imagined themselves to be standing in Kissinger's shoes insist upon when explaining away his crimes. We can only know what actually happened. What actually happened was that Kissinger materially sabotaged the only chance for an end to the war in 1968 as a hedged bet to ensure he would achieve power in Nixon's administration or in Humphreys playing both sides in America to extend a bloody conflict that results in gen in mass genocide, mass death. How many people, I want you to think about that, how many lives a, a genocide steals? How many good people died, just erased from this planet? How many bloodlines erased from the planet just so that Henry Kissinger could self-enrich by playing both sides in America? I want you to really think about that. And if you're one of the people in the audience who thinks it's gauche of me to be glad that somebody like this is no longer able to uh, to engage in any way, even using his name to, to pressure things in a certain direction, I want you to tell me how I am possibly the one who's in the wrong for being glad that somebody like that is no longer able to do that. Monstrous. A true tally will probably never be known of everyone who died so that Kissinger could be a national security advisor. Once in the White House, Nixon and Kissinger found themselves without the leverage to produce a peace accord with Hanoi. In the hopes of manufacturing one, they came up with the madman theory, the idea that North Vietnam would negotiate peace after they came to believe Nixon was adventurous and bloodthirsty enough to risk anything. Oh my, what, genius diplomat, the genius diplomat. Oh my God, imagine thinking that your giant, di your diplomatic theory is to have your guy go on, the, go on TV and shit his pants so that people will think that he's crazy enough to do anything. Oh, okay, Nixon, here's what I need you to do. I need you to go up on stage and start, start clucking like a chicken and go, and they'll think you're crazy. 
crazy, crazy dick. Ge genius level a diplomacy at hand here. Genius. In February 1969, weeks after taking office and lasting through April 1970, the U.S. warplane secretly dropped 110,000 tons of bombs on Cambodia. 110,000 bombs on Cambodia. By summer of 1969, according to a colonel on the Joint Staff, Kissinger, who had no constitutional role in the military chain of command, was personally selecting bombing targets. Get that, okay? I want, I want to read that again. By summer of 1969, according to a colonel on the Joint Staff, Kissinger, who had no constitutional role in the military chain of command, was personally selecting bombing targets. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about this fucking giant sack of, 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 of shit sitting in the back room going, yes, erase that village of innocence. Yes, erase that village. Ah, yes, I would love to see the children blown apart here. Not only was Henry Kissinger carefully screening the raids, he was reading the raw intelligence Colonel Ray B. Sitton told Hirsch for the price of power. A second phase of bombing uh, continued until August of 1973, five months after the final U.S. combat troops withdrew from Vietnam. They continued to bomb Cambodia after they withdrew from Vietnam. By then, U.S. bombs had killed an estimated 100,000 people out of a population of only 700,000. A seventh of the entire population of a country was erased and Henry Kissinger was personally choosing the bombing targets. The final phase of the bombing, which occurred after the Paris Peace Accords mandated U.S. withdrawal from Vietnam, was its most intense, an act of cruel vengeance from a thwarted superpower. Cambodia, like Laos before it, was a formally neutral country, meaning that bombing it was an illegal aggression under the United Nations Charter. But beyond the control of Prince uh, Sihanouk, the North Vietnamese used Cam Cambodian territory for the Ho Chi Minh Trail, a weapons pipeline not unlike the one that America is currently operating for Ukraine. In April 1970, following a coup by American client Colonel Lon Knoll that overthrew threw Sihanouk, uh, Nixon ordered U.S. troops in Vietnam to invade Cambodia outright. In the air or on the ground, they were unable to destroy the weapons trail, only human beings. Those who survived reacted. Sometimes the bombs fell and hit little children, and their fathers would be all for the Khmer Rouge. A former Khmer Rouge cadre told historian Ben Kiernan, founder of Yale University's Genocide Studies Program. This is kind of relevant to right now, isn't it? Sometimes the bombs fell and hit little children and their fathers would be all for the Khmer Rouge. Interesting how, uh, turns out, deranged acts of violence from a superpower can permanently radicalize people against you and into terrible positions. Nixon and Kissinger's failure in Cambodia prompted in 1971 the US South, South Vietnamese invasion of Laos, another failure. Kissinger later blamed defeat on the U.S.'s clients rather than, say, people like himself. In retrospect, I have come to doubt whether the South, South Vietnamese ever really understood what we were trying to accomplish, Kissinger wrote in his memoirs. What a sick fuck. What a sick fuck. Oh, yeah, it was the South Vietnamese's fault that America fucking bungled everything. Jesus Christ. At the time, the secret bombing of Cambodia was a startling offense that prompted substantial political backlash when it eventually became public. One of the articles of impeachment against Nixon prepared by the House Judiciary Committee in 1974 held that bombing Cambodia was a constitutional usurpation of Congress's war powers. But on July 30, the committee ended up rejecting the article, 26 votes to 12, and it never became part of the coalescing impeachment effort that stopped with Nixon's resignation. Forty years later, and likely as a consequence, U.S. presidents regularly bomb countries, or sorry, routinely bomb countries the U.S. is not at war with. 
They provide the barest minimum of disclosure that the bombs have fallen and often not even that. When the U.S. declared war, U.S.'s declared wars fail, as they did in Iraq and Afghanistan, their architects and stewards blame the client militaries and governments that they propped up. They cover their troop withdrawals with futile bombing campaigns that kill people so that American statesmen can save face. Whether he realized or not, when President Biden in July 2021 blamed the Afghans for losing the Afghanistan war, the Afghan military collapsed, sometimes without even trying to fight, was a typical line. He was reaching for Nixon and Kissinger's template. Kissinger played a role in the deaths of so many different peoples that treating each with due consideration requires writing a book. Here is one example of, among many of the sort of carnage Kissinger inflicted indirectly rather than by edict. In 1971, the Pakistani government waged a campaign of genocide to suppress the independence movement in what would become Bangladesh. Pakistan's Yaha Ya 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 Khan, sorry about that. Pakistan's Ya Ya Khan, an architect of the genocide, was valuable to Nixon's ambitions of restoring diplomatic relations with China. So the U.S. let Khan's forces rape and murder at least 300,000 people and at perhaps as high as 3 million. We cannot allow a friend of ours and China's to get screwed in a conflict with a friend of India's, Nixon quoted, quoted Kissinger shrugging. That perspective ty typified Kissinger. The Cold War was a geopolitical balance amongst two great powers. Are you getting an idea for why so many people revile Henry Kissinger? Are you getting a an idea for why I revile Henry Kissinger? Let's continue, shall we? But don't forget to press subscribe and don't forget to press like. Because where else are you going to see this? The purpose of Cold War statecrafts was to maximize American freedom of action to inflict Washington's will on the world. A zero-sum contest that meant restricting the ability of the Soviet Union to inflict Moscow's without the destabilization or outright Armageddon that would result from pursuing a final defeat of the Soviets. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, here, just set it right here. for now. Um, I'll put these over here because uh, I, I got to finish doing this. Thank you. Appreciate that. Where were we? A zero-sum contest that meant restricting the ability of the Soviet Union to, fu to inflict Moscow's without the destabilization or outright Armageddon that would result from pursuing a final defeat of the Soviets. That last part explains much right-wing hostility towards Kissinger. Kissinger represented anti-communism without ideological zeal. He was an energetic, even relentless practitioner of the Cold War, the theater of anti-communist conflict. But like George Kennan before him, Kissinger thought viewing the Cold War in ideological terms missed the point. The point was the American geopolitical dominance, something measured in impunity and achieved by any means necessary. That permitted Nixon and Kissinger the creativity to reopen China, something Nixon would have demagogued anyone else for attempting. Reopening China was by far the greatest achievement of Nixon's foreign policy. It was the rare geopolitical initiative where Kissinger was a mere facilitator. Cy Hirsch in The Price of Power calls Nixon the grand theoretician of uh, rapprochement with Beijing. With Kissinger's with Kissinger uh, with Kissinger, Nixon's occasional operative. Kissinger's dramatic secret July 1971 trip to Beijing in advance of Nixon's visit probably renders that description parsimonious. But, writes Hirsch, there is no evidence that Kissinger seriously considered the question of an American-Chinese rapprochement before his appointment as uh, Nixon's national security advisor. Once it happened, Kissinger became an overnight celebrity, the sort of person destined to be shrouded in myth and apology. Kissinger might not have been motivated by a hatred of communism, but he was a reactionary who empowered and enabled the sort of reactionaries for whom anti-communism was a respectable channel for America's racist and exploitative socioeconomic traditions. His chief aide on the National Security Council was a rabid anti-communist militarist, Army Colonel Alexander Haig, a future Secretary of State for Ronald Reagan. When Kissinger came under attack from neoconservatives and others on the right who couldn't tolerate detente with the Soviets and rapprochement with the Chinese, I don't know if I said that correctly. I apologize if I mispronounced that. 
Neither he nor they recognized that both of them were driven by the Cold War forces that Kissinger stoked when convenient. Most important of all the reactionaries was Nixon, without whom Kissinger would have lacked power and from whom Kissinger would withstand any indignity. Absolutely fucking wild, right? Absolutely deranged. Nixon was one of the original Cold War demagogues, the men who never hesitated to identify communism with black people and the Eastern establishment liberals who he po who postured as allies. His escalation in Vietnam, along with the secret bombing in Cambodia he revealed in a televised address, prompted a resurgence of the anti-war movement. Nixon exploited the mass protests by contrasting them with the silent majority. Hey, does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar? Sounds familiar, right? silent majority the silent majority of loyal americans instead of ending the war as he had campaigned on doing and silencing or co-opting the anti-war movement in the process nixon inflamed a culture war to distract from it it was an echo of his fame infamous southern strategy to harness for the republican party the electoral benefits of white backlash to the civil rights movement we've talked about that on stream before nixon was not subtle about who he meant by the eastern establishment when the media seized upon the U.S. Massacre, massacre at My Lai, Nixon remarked, it's those dirty, rotten, I better put quotes around this. This is Nixon. Nixon remarked, it's those dirty, rotten Jews from New York who are behind it. Nixon's White House counsel, John Ehrlichman, recalled Nixon talking about Jewish traitors in front of Kissinger, including Jews at Harvard. Kissinger would assure the boss that he was one of the good ones. Well, Mr. President, Ehrlichman quoted him responding, there are Jews and there are Jews. Oh my God. Kissinger maintained his standing in part by savaging the Eastern establishment from which he emerged. It was not entirely cynical. Kissinger shared with Nixon a contempt for the defeatism and pessimism of those who in flinched at the unsavory Vietnam War they once supported. He rationalized his purges of the NSC bureaucracy and his marginalization of the State Department, measures that made him indispensable to foreign policy and to Nixon, as protecting American power from those who lack the confidence to wield it. It is revealing that among those who make U.S. foreign policy, Kissinger's perspective is not considered ideological. Yeah, that's how it always worked. They never consider themselves ideologues. Kissinger's consolidation of bureaucratic control was punitive and paranoid. He used the fear of internal leaks to get the FBI to wiretap his staff and the journalists he suspected of receiving their information. Yet the Eastern establishmentarians around Kissinger on his staff or in the press followed him like a puppy seeking an air ear scratch. His cold-blooded American exceptionalism was the perfect tone for speaking to the shaken ruling class. Anthony Lake, who would go on to become National Security Advisor to Bill Clinton, finally quit in May 1970, alongside his colleague Roger Morris. Their breaking points were the Vietnam escalation, Nixon's alcoholism, and the surreptitious White House wiretaps that Nixon also pursued in order to enforce loyalty. But Lake and Morris opted not to go public. I consider the failure to do so the biggest failure of my life, Morris told Cy Hirsch for The Price of Power. We didn't do so on the single calculation that it would destroy Henry. Weeks later, Kissinger, via Hague, had the, H ha had the FBI wiretap Lake. Oh my God. The, uh, the irony. Oh my, the, the absolute irony there. That is uh, deranged, frankly. Hold on one second. I had to make one change there real quick. Cut this out. Uh, Danny, if you uh, see this timestamp, you can cut this part out.
Let's continue. In Southeast Asia, Kissinger destroyed. But in Chile, he helped build a template for the world in which we currently live. On September 4th, 1970, Chileans elected the Democratic Socialist Salvador Allende president. Allende's program was more than redistributionist. It demanded reparation from the U.S. for exploiting it. Chile is rich in copper, and by the mid-1960s, 80% of its copper production was controlled by American corporations, particularly the firms Anaconda Copper and Kennecott. When Allende nationalized mining assets held by the two companies, Allende informed them he would deduct estimated excess profit from a compensatory package he was willing to pay the firms. In this, it was this sort of unacceptable policy that prompted Kissinger to remark during an intelligence meeting about two months before Allende's election, I don't see why we need to stand idly by and watch a country go communist due to the irresponsibility of its own people. Kissinger meant that there must, have ne there must never be an example of a country in America's sphere of influence delivering socialism through the ballot. Henry saw Allende as being a far more serious th threat even than Castro, Kissinger's staffer Morris told Hirsch. Allende was a living example of democratic social reform in Latin America. Kissinger and the CIA dis had decided to overthrow Allende just days after Allende's election. Upon learning what was in motion, the U.S. ambassador in Santiago, Edward Corey, who was second to none in opposing Allende, cabled Kissinger that to actively encourage a coup could lead us to a Bay of Pigs failure. An, Apollo, an, sorry, an apoplectic Kissinger told Corey to stay out of the way, according to Tim Weiner's uh, Legacy of Ashes, the history of the CIA. When the CIA failed at what Corey termed a Rube Goldberg gambit, to get the Chilean Congress to stop Allende from taking office. That's right, the CIA tried a January 6th style coup in Chile. Haig urged his boss to purge the key left-wing dominated slots in the agency. Corey was wrong in the end. Kissinger's policy of overthrowing Allende, Allende why not support extremists? That was his policy is what they're saying there. His policy was, why not exp uh, uh, support extremists, which he spitballed in a December 1970 White House meeting with the CIA's covert operations chief, Tam Karamessens, paid off on September 11th, 1973, when a military junta took power, prompting Allende's suicide. He would be among the first of, th of 3,200 Chileans to die violently under the 17-year regime of Augusto Pinochet and his Caravana de la Muerte, Caravan of Death, to say nothing of the tens of thousands who were tortured and imprisoned, imprisoned. In the Eisenhower period, we would be heroes, Kissinger told Nixon in a telephone conversation days after the, after the coup, and in the same week, he denied at his Senate confirmation hearings that the U.S. played any role in it. Damn. Damn, that is a un, that is a that is just a raw level of duplicitousness there. God. It's wild, right? Getting a getting a uh, getting a full download of this guy's history. It's gonna it's gonna be a real trip for everyone to go see what all the other news uh, news outlets are saying about him. How many how many glowing obituaries are praising him as a as a diplomatic genius? Although to be fair. The other one, the other ones that I read so far, were, seem to be struggling to find kind words for him. It is true that, Hen that among the populace, among the general people, Henry Kissinger has a terrible, terrible reputation. But of course, he uh, he you know hopnobs and friend and has friends all among America's political elite. That much is very true. The coup in Chile was only the beginning. Within two years, Pinochet's regime invited Milton Friedman, Arnold Harberger, and other economists from the University of Chicago to advise them. Chile pioneered the implementation of their agenda, severe government budgetary austerity. This is what we call neoliberalism. The, um, the, th this is, this, Chile, Pinochet's regi regime in Chile is the, the, is literally where neoliberalism started from. The idea of, of extreme uh, austerity, extreme support of um, of privatized uh, industry, a uh, crushing of of unions, the undermining of labor laws uh, and labor protections. That is where it started.
and it was Henry Kissinger who was behind it. Chile pioneered the implementation of their agenda. A se severe government budgetary austerity, relentless assaults on organized labor, privatization of state assets, including health care and public pensions, layoffs of government employees, abolition of wages and price controls, and deregulation of capital markets. Multinationals were not only granted the right to repatriate 100% of their profits, but were given guaranteed exchange rates to help them do so. Grandin writes in his book, Empire's Workshop, European and American bankers flocked to Chile before its 1982 economic collapse. Oh my God. The World Bank and Inter-American Development Bank loaned Pinochet $3.1 billion between 1976 and 1986. Isn't that crazy that their experiment, their, their free market experiment that's supposed to prove the concept of their world required out, insane external investors and then led to an economic collapse anyway? Isn't that absurd? Wild to think about. Just remember, all of these people who posture as the shepherds of society, these so-called statesmen, are always just looking to self-enrich and self-empower. Here we go. As Corey Robin has documented, Friedrich von Hayek's neoliberally mo neoliberal Mont Pelerin Society held a 1981 meeting in the very city where the junta plotted the replacement of democratic socialism with a harbinger of today's global economic order. Pinochet's torture chambers were the maternity ward of neoliberalism, a baby delivered bloody and screaming by Henry Kissinger. This was the just and liberal world order that Hillary Clinton considered Kissinger's life work. Brutal. Absolutely brutal writing. He was no less foundational in pushing the frontiers of where American military power could operate. It turned out the secret bombing of Cambodia and Laos, which landed years, represented a template. When Nixon in 1970 revealed the secret bombings, it was a step too far even for Th Thomas Schelling, one of the Pentagon's favorite defense academics, who called them sickening. As Greg Grandin writes in Kissinger's Shadow, the Cambridge to Washington set was not prepared in 1970 to accept that the U.S. had the right to destroy an enemy safe haven in a country that it was not at war with and, and to do it all in secret, thereby shielding a war from basic public scrutiny. I want you, like, this kind of thing right there is where people, um, where people who make a case for America's fascistic nature really have a point. The fact that, like, over time, especially over the last, like, over the 1900s, uh, the late 1900s specifically, the fact that the, the sort of trend is more things being done in secret, less things being de available to the public's eye, more things being done in secret, less things being able to be voted on, more and more and more is stolen away from democratic oversight and even not just, e not just democratic oversight, but general popular knowledge. There is so much stuff that happens that is within the constitutional right of the people to control that you don't even know happens and that's intentional. It's so that there could be unilateral power wielded by whoever's in power. And this is where the fascistic nature of America's current uh, status quo comes in. After 9-11, those assertions became accepted. Foundational pillars of a war on terror permitting four presidents to bomb for 20 years, Pakistanis, Yemenis, Somalis, Libyans, Syrians, and others. Kissinger met with Pinochet in Santiago on June of 1976. It was a time of rising U.S. congressional anger at Pinochet's reign of terror. Kissinger informed the general that he was obliged to make an anodyne criticism of Pinochet to forestall adverse legislation. My evaluation is that you are a victim of all left-wing groups around the world, Kissinger said, according to a declassified cable, and that your greatest sin is that you overthrew a government which was, which was going communist. Three months later, U.S. diplomats warned Kissinger about Operation Condor, an international campaign of right-wing assassinations pursued by the anti-communist regimes of Chile, Argentina, and Uruguay. Kissinger, quote, has instructed that no further action be taken on this matter, according to a September 6, 16, 1976 cable. 
Five days later, a car bomb in placed by Pinochet's agent detonated along Washington, D.C.'s Embassy Row, killing Orlando Letelier, Allende's foreign minister, and his American co-worker, Roti Ro oh, sorry, Roni Moffat. Holy moly. Imagine that. He had information that there were right-wing assassinations being planned and that a car bomb was done in D.C. In D.C. In 1999, Pinochet was arrested in London through an effort by Baltazar, well, by Baltazar Garzon, a Spanish judge investigating Operation Condor. Kissinger urged the British not to extradite the general. I would be very happy if Pinochet was allowed home, uh, Kissinger told an interviewer. This episode has gone on long enough and all my sympathies are with him. Two years later, the administration of George W. Bush responded contemptuously to the Chilean Supreme Court's effort to compel Kissinger to testify. It is unjust and ridiculous that a distinguished service servant of this country should be harassed by foreign courts in this way, an official told the Daily Telegraph. The paper noted that Kissinger was an informal advisor to Bush, as he was to many presidents. The Bush administration's declaration of protection for Kissinger, coupled with his rejection of the Rome Treaty on the International Criminal Court, um, extinguished a glimmer of hope that Kissinger would someday join Pinochet under arrest. It was always a fantasy. The international architecture that the U.S. and its allies established after World War II, shorthanded today as the rules-based international order, somehow never gets around to applying the same pressure on a hegemonic United States that it applies to U.S. hostile or defiant powers. It reflects the organizing principle of American exceptionalism. America acts. It is not acted upon. Henry Kissinger was a supreme architect of the rules-based international order. In that regard, Kissinger was, a, was singular, but by no means unique. Kissinger built upon the foundations constructed by Henry Morgenthau, Dean Acheson, George Kennan, Paul Nietzsche, the Dulles brothers, the Bundy brothers, JFK. You could go all the way back to Albert Thayer Mahan and Teddy Roosevelt if you wanted, or even James Monroe, or depending on how fundamental you think empire is to America, 1619. He and Nixon chose to escalate in Vietnam and pursue the destruction of Cambodia. But the Pentagon Papers showed that the Vietnam War was the result of compounding decisions made in the Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson administrations. The Vietnamese guerrilla and justice minister, Truong Nu Tang, writes in his Viet Cong memoir that Kissinger, whose intellect he praises, inherited a conceptual framework from his American and French predecessors that led him to disaster. Kissinger and Nixon turned that into Watergate. As Grandin pointed out earlier in this story, Watergate began with a demand for vengeance on Daniel Ellsberg, the anti-Kissinger, for, for leaking the Pentagon Papers. Watergate was a grim demonstration for neither the first nor the last time that the crimes America commits abroad have a dialectical relationship with the crimes that America commits at home. This right here, by the way, is is more true than ever an example of this is the fact that um the same techniques that have been used to brutally suppress uh the people of iraq fall uh, during and following the iraq war have now been uh imported back home um the same tactics that were taught to american soldiers in the iraq war are currently being taught to american police and they're being deployed on protesters, people who are using their First Amendment constitutional right. Infamy has as many fathers as victory. That, ultimately, is why Kissinger died a celebrity with the wealth necessary to get taken in by Theranos. It's why Roger Morris and Anthony Lake opted against telling the country that the commander-in-chief was an alcoholic who was secretly surveilling his real and imagined critics. Whatever Kissinger's organ, or origins, whatever rants about Jew boys he had to endure, Kissinger was an exemplar of the, of the self-confident geopolitical potency that America's elites, whatever they might personally think of Henry Kissinger, uh, want America to make the world respect. 
when the Roger Morrises and Anthony Lakes and Hillary Clinton see Henry Kissinger, they see, despite what they will rotely and euphemistically acknowledge as his flaws, themselves as they wish to be. Kissinger lived for over half a century in the world that he had made. He was its hubris. He could see that the Iraq war would be a disaster, but he went along with it anyway, declaring the case for removing Iraq's capacity of mass destruction is extremely strong. Kissinger's calculation, expressed in the noblest possible way, is that acceptance of an impending disaster is the price of influencing and hence mitigating it. His accommodation to the inevitability of political decisions he thought were folly harkened back to his 1968 embrace of Nixon. What were the lives of Vietnamese, Cambodians, or Iraqis compared to Kissinger's opportunity to help shape history? But Iraq and the broader war on terror that Kissinger wanted expanded lest it peter out into an intelligence operation while the rest of the region gradually slides back into the pre-9-11 pattern, presaged the world that Kissinger made coming apart at the foundations. The man who repositioned U.S. foreign policy as a wedge between China and Russia lived long enough to see the February 4 de declaration uniting Moscow and Beijing. The reactionary forces he encouraged at home and abroad are showing the world that the rules-based international order is about capitalism and not democracy. Whatever bitterness Kissinger in his final days experienced over the erosion of his enterprise is little comfort to his millions of victims. America denied them cl the closure Kathleen Treanor experienced when, when America declaring justice ended Timothy McVeigh. Wow. Just so we're clear, once again, this is Henry Kissinger, war criminal beloved by America's ruling class, finally dies by Spencer Ackerman at the Rolling Stone. What a absolutely brutal piece. And I'm going to end this. I don't really have much else to add to that. I wanted to read that because I think it's important. And I think that there's going to be a lot of people who do not cover this, who do not choose to cover it this way, who do not choose to critique Henry Kissinger, who instead either remain silent or look the other way while people praise him. I don't have much personal to add to that. It pretty much says it all. It lays it all out. I'm glad that you were here with me to listen to this because you know, we already saw earlier in this stream uh, that there's a lot of people who are unwilling to talk about these things, who are unwilling to talk about the bloodshed and the duplicitousness and the lying and the explicit uh, deconstruction of democracy and freedom. I want to end this with a quote. Those of you who are watching the live stream on my website, demonmama.com, already got to hear this earlier, but this is for you all who are going to be watching the video later, okay? And this is a quote from Anthony Bourdain. Anthony Bourdain talking about Henry Kissinger. Once you've been to Cambodia, you'll never stop wanting to beat Henry Kissinger to death with your bare hands. You will never again be able to open a newspaper and read about that treacherous, prevaricating, murderous scumbag sitting down for a nice chat with Charlie Rose or attending some black tie affair for a new glossy magazine without choking. Witness what Henry did in Cambodia, the fruits of his genius for statesmanship, and you will never understand why he is not sitting in the dock at The Hague next to Milosevic. While Henry continues to nibble nori rolls and rimaki at A-list parties, Cambodia, the neutral nation he secretly and illegally bombed, invaded, undermined, and then threw to the dogs, is still trying to raise itself up on its one remaining leg. Again, Anthony Bourdain talking about the now-dead Henry Kissinger. The world became a safer place tonight. That's all I have to say. If you enjoyed this segment and my reading of that article, if you enjoyed my commentary, if you found my voice interesting and powerful, make sure you press subscribe down below because I do this kind of stuff all the time in addition to a lot of other stuff. I'd love to have you hear the signal. Thank you very much.